one, one of the things I've been helping out with for a, a while now, even throughout COVID, uh, has just kind of been keeping some of that uh, community going and, you know, being intentional about meeting weekly. And we've been able to do a lot of stuff during the summer. You know, we have more resources like the youth room down there. Uh, we, we have a lot of, uh, just a lot of fun every night, I would say. And uh, this summer has been no exception to that. And we're, we're about to put youth on, on break for a few weeks here, but it's, it's just been, it's been a wild ride to, to be able to get in and help run that thing. And it's great. Yeah. You know, Ashton, what I really appreciate about you is, is, you know, you have many gifts and it's awesome, but your character is, is outstanding. You just have a sense of integrity about yourself. Um, I know if my kids were that age now, they're more your age, but I would love to them be mentored by you because you, you love God, you love God's word, you, 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 you're encouraging, you're understanding, kids open up to you because you have an openness about your spirit. And uh, so I just want to say it's, it's really been great having you here full time. And now in the fall, uh, what are our plans? What are your plans for the fall? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm going back to school. I go to a, a school locally in, I guess, in, more in Surrey called Pacific Life Bible College. I'm going there for my fourth year. Uh, I'm, I'm switching out programs. So I was in the youth ministry program. Now I'm switching into the biblical studies program. Uh, and... I mean, it's just a slight difference. It's mostly the same courses and stuff, but just a few key differences there. I uh, just, I want to learn more about the Bible and kind of intentionally dive into more of that stuff. Uh, I'm joining on student leadership. So that's going to be a new thing for me, getting to help plan events, be there to support other students, uh, something that I've, I've been looking forward to for a while. And I'm, I'm happy that this is the year I get to do that. And yeah, I guess in terms of youth, we're still going to go on. We're still going to go hard with youth. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to see what God has planned for us going forward. And uh, yeah, I mean, last year around September, we just experienced so much growth in our high school program. This year, we're combining the two programs again. Uh, so rather than just what we had before junior youth and senior youth, we're going back to just a one night thing. And it just means we get to put all the more energy into that one night and make it a really big special event each week for all the students that show up. So that's, that's exciting. Awesome. That's so great. I'd like to say a prayer for you, Ashton, before you head down. God, I just want to thank you that, uh, that Ashton is putting himself available to you. Uh, Lord, to see a young man like this at the prime of his life, just say, God, you're, you're first in my life, and I want to serve you, and I want to know about more about your word. Lord, I pray as he studies this fall that you will just make it alive in his life dynamic and the Holy Spirit would just take these words it would not be a in any way a dry academic exercise but he would just keep being molded and changed by your word and I thank you for his involvement in the youth and we just pray that you would continue to help our youth to grow and to thrive at such an incredibly important age I thank you for the way in which uh, Ashton is here just to help in so many ways and may you bless him this fall I pray in your name amen thanks All right. That's good. So I'm sure Ashton will be back to clean up the, my nursery this week. Um, if you'd like to give to ministry at New Hope, you are welcome to do that. There's a table at the back. You can give in various ways, electronically or in whatever way you'd like. And, uh, you know, the gifts that you give to New Hope, it helps so many things. Among them, helping to, to uh, support uh, the growth of young, young people, uh, Sarah, Ashton, others who are growing in their in their leadership and in their journey with God. So we want to invite you to give there. Uh, you can also give online if you, if you want to. Uh, this week we're continuing with the parables. We're going to be going through the rest of August on the stories that Jesus told. Um, the, 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 the reason for these stories that Jesus said, uh, that he gave, was to communicate a central truth. Uh, there's usually one primary point, and it's there not to be allegories, because allegories, you take everything, represent something. And in parables, it's not like that. Sometimes people take too much of a deep dive into parables and go, this means this and this means... It's, it's really meant to, to, to make one point, and it's not meant to say everything about everything. But uh, we take the whole scripture for that. But it is, um, the primary purpose of a parable is to conceal and reveal. 
So for those who are uninterested and really don't care, it will conceal. Uh, it, it, it won't give you much. But for those who are willing to explore and look deeper into these stories, we go, ah, that's what Jesus is saying. And it becomes very rich and memorable in our lives. Um, they're there to show us what God's kingdom is like. And um, because it's about God's kingdom, there's so many aspects of God's kingdom. There are many parables, but um, God is saying, I want you to begin to imagine. You know, anytime you enter a story, it's like, I want you to imagine what God's kingdom can be amongst you. So oftentimes we get into the boredom and just the kind of the day-to-day, -day, okay, I don't expect anything different, I don't expect anything new, nothing's going to change, and the parables tell us, no, when the kingdom of God breaks in, stuff changes, and God does amazing things in your life. So God is there to show us, he's like, sometimes it's more like a mustard seed, sometimes it's like a woman who finds a lost coin, sometimes it's like a person who plants a vineyard, and like this week, it's about a farmer who sows a, a field. And he sows a field of wheat. And the parable is found in Matthew chapter 13. And it starts at verse 24. And the great thing about this parable is it actually not only tells us the parable, the story. Jesus tells us the story. But then he also explains it. And so we've got an explanation about it as well. So if you want to follow along either in your Bible or electronic device or just on the screen. Matthew chapter 13. It says in verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the weeds sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them all up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. So then you drop down a few verses down to verse 36, and then he gives the explanation. Then Jesus left the crowd and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. It's another word for God. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will grow them, they will throw them into the blazing furnace, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So an interesting story about farming and weeding. And probably not many of us here are farmers today. But I can imagine Jesus, he's, he's out there and it's an agricultural society. There's a field of wheat right there. And he goes, let's look at that wheat. Now let me tell you about my, the kingdom of heaven. He's making something visible be very concrete and tangible in the kingdom. But some of us do some gardening. I know I do. And I have a particular uh, kind of a garden bed with some flowers in it. That every year I have a challenge at the beginning of spring getting the weeds under control. It must be just bad dirt right from the start. But uh, I go after it sometimes too early and I'm pulling up plants that I think are weeds and I end up pulling up flowers. I don't know if you've had that experience. And, uh, and then later on I go, wow, there's nothing coming up. <laughs> and sometimes I have to wait till just the right time where I can kind of distinguish the difference between the weeds and the wheat. 
Well, what's interesting about this passage is the weeds in this story are actually, Jesus didn't use just the generic word weed for this. He actually used the, the word zanzania. Now, I don't really know that much about it. Another translation of it or interpretation can be tares or darnell. It's actually a specific kind of weed that when it's growing, it looks very much like wheat. Like you, you can't really tell the difference. But when it comes time when the, actually the wheat kind of heads out and the grain appears, the, the zizania, the darnell, does not do it at all. It, there's nothing. It's empty. There's no fruit from this plant. And so that's specifically what Jesus was telling. At the beginning, you can't tell the difference as it's growing, but then when it's nearly mature, you can tell the difference. So Jesus is saying, I want you to make sure that you know the difference. They say that to distinguish flowers from weeds, simply pull up everything. What grows back is weeds. And so they're saying, shall we go after it? Shall we pull up the weeds? And Jesus is saying, no. And uh, there's also this aspect of the story where an enemy comes and attacks them. And this enemy comes and, and, and the violence was done. And uh, he plants the weeds in with the wheat. And uh, they're allowed to grow together. But Jesus says at the right time when the harvest comes, there's going to be a separation. And it's going to take place. And the weeds are going to be burned up. So we're not really that concerned about the backstory of why the weeds were sown in the first place. But the story does say, it tells us the response of the landowner. The landowner ultimately being God. And uh, Jesus here is saying, I want you to get a full picture of what's happening in the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, I want you to know that there is a time that God's going to deal with things. And in this life, there's going to be this kind of visible church and it's going to be made up of sinners and saints. There's going to be a whole mix in the whole thing. And it's just as it's impossible sometimes to know what's what, God is saying, I want you to know that I know who's there. And ultimately, there will be judgment. So there's a number of things that we can take from this. I've got a few of them. One of the things that this parable is telling us is be patient. God has a plan, and he's working that out over time. I think that's the fundamental story, the message behind the story. Know that God sees and knows exactly what's going on here on earth. And that is such an important truth for us to know. That is such an incredible thing for us to live our lives day to day when things happen to us and we go, what happened here? I thought that was a good guy. (laughs) And then this happens. How did that work? God says, you know what? Be patient. I have a plan in all of this. I'm working it out. You know, there's, there's, there's two kingdoms in this world and they're vying for each other. It's telling us that this is a reality. And um, there's something that's much more important than knowing the difference. It's just knowing where you belong. Are you living in the kingdom? Are you, are you living this out? Now, Jesus, he told, he did a ton of miracles. And where Jesus was teaching and speaking at the time, there was an incredible amount of oppression. And a lot of people in power that were just doing some horrible things to the Israelites at the long time. And there was a long list of people who claimed to be part of the kingdom. And uh, even other historians talk about these different leaders that came up, different kind of so-called rabbis. And Jesus is saying, I'm working, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time. And a lot of people who, who, who rose up and said, there's a new kingdom, they were oftentimes, they would try and seize political power. They would come into situations and try and grab hold of some, some, some people who would kind of give them their allegiance and get them behind them. And they would work for some immediate changes in the world right now. And all of these things would blow up. At some point or another, they would come to nothing. But Jesus is saying, the kingdom of God 
is much more deeper, more radical. It's, more, it's bigger than just some kind of movement that's happening at the time. And what Jesus was really telling these people is, stop thinking about politics. <laughs> this is bigger than something that's political or psychological. He says, there, the reality is that there is an evil. And it is, is kind of infiltrated throughout the world. It's there in the fields. And yet I'm bringing something that will go to the very roots, something even more radical. And God is saying, what Jesus is saying here is, can you imagine a world where all of that evil is rooted out? Where everything is taken away? Where there's, can you imagine a world where there's no more addictions, no more mental illness, no more breakdown of family, no more racism, no more, because all of this opposition is going to be destroyed. And Jesus says, I'm coming for something bigger and deeper and richer, but be patient. Patience is so hard for us, isn't it? We want to see some, you know, that problem needs to be solved right now. And we read in the news or we watch on the news and it might be something big and epic, like, you know, something that's happening, coming down politically, or it might be even in our own lives. We go, God, I want you to deal with this now. Dig it out. Get it out. <laughs> And God says, I want you to be patient. I, am, I have a plan. I'm working it out. It's a plan that is so big that you won't even be capable to conceive of it. And sometimes it'll look like you're going three steps back. But in fact, I'm advancing my kingdom in the midst of this. I don't know what it is for you, but you might be feeling like you've taken some hits recently. You've taken some, it seems like setbacks. Could it be that God is actually working out a plan? And we don't know in the immediate and in the now how that might look, but he's doing it. And he's saying, be patient. You know, we are such impatient people. We are so immediate in our thoughts. I don't know about you, but in the summertime, you know, the amount of road construction that just happens in our city and when you get behind traffic, it's like, ah, I can't believe it. This is gonna, you know, I'm gonna lose three minutes. You know, we are so immediate in our mentality that we think if, unless God does something right now, unless he breaks through, unless he deals with that bad guy or whatever that person, that situation is, we're thinking, oh, God's, you know, God's not powerful. He's not at work. And God says, I want you to know I'm doing something so big so radical, so deep, it's bigger than you can imagine, but be patient. I'm working it out. And God is giving people, even in this world, people who are opposed to him, people who may seem to be going under the radar, but are actually up to a lot of no good. He's actually such a gracious and loving and forgiving God that he's giving them the maximum opportunity to change. To, to grow, to, to mature. And when we realize that God's really sovereign, that he really does have a plan, it changes our whole mentality. I think about this, and this is maybe a little bit of a sidebar here, but even how it, it helps us with tragedy. You know, times when we think that this can't possibly be something that can be worked out for God's glory and our good, in life, I think of uh, being in a hospital room with a young couple once whose, whose child, whose infant, had, had, had gone into some water and, and drowned. And had actually been like, they had to take the child off of life support and, and we're holding this child. It's, it seems like the most absurd tragedy. And and yet the couple, and I was thinking, how is this couple possibly going to survive this? How are they going to go forward? But this couple had an incredible trust and faith that somehow, though God wouldn't, you know, ordain that and, and he's not behind it, he's still God and he's doing something. And the remarkable thing about this couple, and I just bumped into them recently, is they just are living, this happened some years back and not here in this church, but I, I bumped into them and they're just like, I, we're just loving God and he's so good to us. And, and, and they're just fully full of faith. 
And I look at that couple and I go, that is only, that can only happen. And certainly there was grief and certainly there was all the things that we go through as humans. It's not living in some alternate reality. But their ability to move forward in life, to continue parenting the kids that they did have and to continue going, they, they, everything about their language, and it's not airy, fairy, flowery language, but it's just like, we just know deep down that God's still got a plan for us and he's still using us. And he's gonna, he's gonna work out his purposes in this life. And part of that is just the backdrop of knowing that there is an eternity. And, and, and whatever happens on this earth, God's gonna set all things right. His kingdom is breaking through now and we believe it, even if it goes it defies all the logic that we have and we're going forward. It, this parable also tells us to be alert. There is an enemy at work in the world. It's, you know, one of the things about this parable is actually just describing reality. I think uh, followers of Jesus are able to be the, the biggest realists, the most grounded realists in this world. Because though we don't have all the answer for tragedy and for evil, that's for sure. We don't claim to that. But we know that there is evil. We know that there is an author of evil. That there really is a real enemy, Satan. And he's at work in this world. And he's out to destroy and do violence and to rob and to kill. And it's a real deal. And yet there is also, so we're not surprised by evil, but there is also a God who is so all-powerful, who is against all evil in all of its forms. And he is calling us to live lives that are alert to the evil, that are here to make a difference in this world, to stand against evil. We don't sit passively by. He's got us as human, living, breathing humans to stand up against systems, to stand up against evil. And yet, we can live in this world knowing that we, aren't, we don't become preoccupied with evil and just live in this dark, dark place. And we also aren't ignorant that there is, a, there is evil and there is an enemy up to no good in this world. We're able to look beyond the horizon and see that God is doing something, even in the midst of it. It's a, it's a wonderful place that God wants us to be. Very aware there is evil. We can see it. We know it. It's around us. And yet, we also have our eyes on the horizon, which is where God is. And he's helping us to make it through this maze of life. And what we oftentimes see is it's not chaotic. It's not random. He's got, he, he's saying, I'm doing something and I'm going to help you through. I think of it a bit like um, some years back, I had some friends who, who had a business selling uh, ski boats. And uh, so I'd done some skiing before meeting them. But then with them, I did a whole bunch of skiing. Uh, water skiing and uh, so they were teaching me the finer skills or maybe even the rougher skills because that's where I'm at um, with slalom water skiing and they would bring me to a course you know where these uh, buoys I, that's how you say it right I was getting it's such a hard word to say but these buoys you've probably seen them they're, they're all lined up and you have to ski the slalom course through it like this and and they, uh, you know, they were teaching me how to do it. You know, how do you lean? How do you do this whole thing? And uh, I just kept hitting the buoys. Like, you know, you're supposed to go around them, and I just kept hitting them. And they pointed out to me, if you look at the buoy, if you focus on it, you're going to hit it. And you have to crank your head and look towards the, the bank, look to the horizon, and then you'll make it around the buoy, not hit it. And uh, I think it's got an incredible application for our lives. If we're just focused on the enemy, we're just looking, we're just, God, but God said, no, I want you to look at the bigger picture. The harvest is there. God's doing something. He's working things out. And it neither puts us in this Messiah complex that I'm going to just fix everything because we know, you know, and the evil is there. It's going to happen. But one day God is going to take care of all those things. And it makes us active in this world because we're energized by his power and his strength in our lives because we know that he's producing fruit in our lives. We're the, he's working through us. We're able to look at ourselves and going, am I a wheat? Yes. <laughs> I'm a child of God. He's doing a work in my life. 
and it's going to produce fruit. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says, Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. So the thing for a Christ follower is we don't get into all the blame towards humans. We know there's something else behind it. It keeps us in the bigger picture. And we go, I know there's an enemy at work. And we also are able to be alert to this. The kingdom, the good news of the kingdom is among you. He's also saying there's an incredible harvest going on. Look at all the wheat. Look at what God is doing. He's maturing what he wants. He's producing this fruit in your life. And we can look at it and go, we can, we can see all the ways in the world where God is at work and not be overwhelmed by the evil. And then another point that this story tells us about is, to, is a, a point on humility, to be humble, to know that God alone is the judge of all people. It's not about us. You know, partly in our society today, which is so immediate, you know, when something is said, especially online, it's expected that you're going to come out and condemn. And and, and I I heard somebody recently say, if you wanted to think of of the best way possibly to fragment and to destroy society, invent Twitter. Uh, This is what this person said, you know, because it's just so immediate. And, you know, we live in this world where, you know, we have this catchphrase, you know, don't judge me. But the amount of judgment that goes on, God's saying, I don't want you to be about that. Certainly you can judge evil acts. You can judge what is done. But you leave it up to God to say, you know what? You deal with that person. And in a world of, uh, especially in a world of media, to social media, to believe that to when you hear something, to not right away believe the very worst in the person, but believe the very best intentions about what they might be saying. And it takes us out of these little skirmishes and battles that we go, no, no, I'm about God's work, letting him pull up the weeds. I don't have to react knee-jerk to everything. There's times to speak out. I'm going to say things about what, what God's will is in this world. But I'm not going to feel like I've got to make everything right. God's about that. So we remain humble. We let God say who's in and who's out. We let him do the judging. And we just are humbly go, you know what? I have some level of light. God has given me this light enlightenment. I'm so thankful for that. That doesn't put me anywhere above anybody else. I know I fail so many times. I think of one guy, one person who said, you know, to another person, I'd like to go to church, but it's so full of hypocrites. And the other person's reply was, well, that's okay. There's always room for one more. You know, if we, we, we know that we walk in going, there's a mixture of, of this in, in my life. You know, we will be surprised one day. Jesus was clear about that. Who, who may be in? In Matthew chapter 25, uh, Jesus talking about, you know, those who, who are who are doing the fruits of his work in this world. And it's sometimes surprising who might be the wheat. Who is it that God is doing things through? And it says in verse 37 of Matthew 25, then the righteous will answer him. This is on the day of judgment. Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? Or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw a stranger and welcomed you? Or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer, truly I tell you, just as you did it to the one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And verse 44, it says, then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or stranger or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. Jesus is saying, we might be surprised (laughs) at that day who might be in so to speak and who's out God is at work and we leave that to him and then finally the challenge is to be fruitful we're called to partner with God's purposes he's got a plan we don't sit passively by we say God could you develop your fruit in me you know when when a head of of wheat comes up and I remember very very specifically when I as a teenager um, moved to Saskatchewan 
and my grandfather was a, was a, a farmer. And for the first time seeing these fields of wheat, he had the most picturesque little farm with the red barn and everything down in the valley of this. And, 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 he, and, he, and he said, hey, you know what? You can eat this stuff. And he took the head of wheat and he rolled it on his hand. And then, you know, all of a sudden the, the little kernels came out and we put it in. He said, it's like chewing gum. I started chewing and I'm going, man, this is the worst chewing gum I've ever tasted. <laughs> but when you think about the nourishment that comes from all that grain, and, you know, when it's put into, into bread and into so many different kinds of uses, uh, how it sustains and gives life to the world. We know right now, even with some of the blockages on the grain, that the outcome can be tr- tr- traumatic to the world if the, if the wheat isn't about being out there and doing its work. How much more so in this world, as Christ followers, if we don't allow ourselves to mature, if we don't allow our, the fruit to grow in our lives. And to take the metaphor a little bit further, but where do we find the strength and the source? It's from the rich nutrients of God. And it, it develops love and joy and peace and goodness and patience and perseverance and kindness and all of the good fruit that will make such a difference in this world. And God says, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to see the fields, to be a part of it, this beautiful replenishing work of God. He's wanting to flourish and feed the world through you. Let his maturing work be done in you. Let him take care of the zizania. (laughs) Let him take care of what might be there. And let's be all about him and his purposes in this world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have a plan, that you are at work doing it, that we can trust you, that we don't have to have the, the whole picture. We can't possibly know the whole picture. You're telling that, us that in this parable. You're gonna gather it up. You're gonna do away with all that is evil. And while we live and in this world, Lord, we wanna be all about you. And if we're all about you, it's gonna be all about goodness. And it's out of, out of, thankfulness to you Lord that you've planted us that you're doing your work in us that you are the one we ultimately answer to and we thank you Lord for the freedom it gives us and we just trust you Lord teach us how to trust it is so hard to trust that you are at work that you do have a plan for today for this week in our lives Lord may we walk in it in your name amen
As you go about your week, may you have hope. God is at work. The fields are much wheat, and may God produce his wheat in your life. Have a great week.